important nonetheless. So uh, let's go ahead and get, does anyone have any uh, objections to, or would anyone like to move to accept the agenda um, with the consent agenda? I believe there was just a um, re-up on the PO box. We did get, we negotiated a lower price, so props to Craig for that. Um, so can I get a motion? Thank you, Tracy. So moved. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Um, okay, any objections to that? Okay, all in favor of passing? Great, thank you guys. Um, do we have any changes to the minutes from last month? George had one minor um, edit to the minutes that okay. I've already made. Anybody else have anything? I know they're really brief, but I mean, we have these big re recordings, so I don't have to do a lot of typing, which is really good for all of you. Um, <laughs> but if anybody has any other edits. No, motion just motion came to approve. Off. Motion to approve. Anybody? Newman said he would George and then I said, saw George as a second. Any objections? Awesome. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and pop on over to our uh, rep updates. I see Teddy and AJ are both here. So we'll start with them. Uh, Coda can't make it tonight. So I'll go ahead and read his at the end when everyone else is done. Um, so I guess AJ, I'll give you the floor first. And then we'll go to Teddy. Yeah, no, thank you so much, um, everybody. And Senator Mojay Castrada, you can call me AJ just here on behalf of Assembly Member Christopher Ward's office. Uh, you know, I'll just keep this brief. Just uh, two things. The first, I just, I think I said, I think we pitched this last week or the last meeting we were here, but I just want to make sure everybody uh, who has not already has signed up on myturn.ca.gov. Uh, it's very important that you reserve a spot for your for your vaccination if you are eligible, and if you are not, uh, that system will will notify you once once you are. Um, I, I signed up. Two months ago, or whenever it became available, I have, I have yet to be notified that I'm eligible, but I'm sure my time will, will come soon. Uh, and I intend to get that back as soon as I possibly can. Uh, but there's clearly others that are uh, that are more um, that you know that that need it uh, sooner. Uh, educators, teachers, staff, um, for emergency responders, and those. So I'm happy to wait my turn. But if you just go on myturn.ca.gov, you can get access to that. Uh, to that vaccine and that notification system. The second thing I just want to let everybody know that um, on February 20, 22nd, Governor Newsom signed to a comprehensive package. Uh, and in that package was uh, an extension to the California Small Business COVID-19 Relief Grant. Initially, there was only going to be two rounds of that. That was now, now uh, four additional rounds have been added and that will start on Friday. Uh, those rounds are for different sectors of the economy. I believe uh, round the next the upcoming round is only for applicants that applied for the first two but didn't make it. So that round is specifically for them. Uh, and the next four are for or the next three are for nonprofits or small business. They get very into the weeds and who, who's eligible for what. Uh, I'm going to put my contact information in the chat box, uh, and I'll also include a link to a website that gets more into depth about each round when to apply. And who can actually apply for that for that assistance for small businesses and, and nonprofits? And those are my two biggest uh, updates. Obviously, I can answer any questions anybody has, or or if you have any uh, issues, state related issues, EDB related issues, um, please feel free to reach out to me at, at any point. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone have any questions for our state assembly members' office? Awesome. Thanks. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, Teddy, I'll give you the floor. Hey, thanks, Andrea. I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, it's been a busy start to the year. And yeah, I echo the sentiments about the rain and the thunder earlier. My dog had no reaction, so that was good, but I expected him to like do something, but he didn't. Anyway, I hope everyone is well. Uh, we're obviously watching a few things. It's been a busy, busy start to the year. Um, uh, just a couple of things to highlight. The council uh, had a report on the mid-year budget, so we're continuing to monitor that. It's not a lot of good news, uh, obviously, um, but we'll still be advocating for a lot of the priorities that were in our budget priority memo, including the major CIP projects that uh, we're continuing to monitor and, and advocate for. Uh, there's some good news that relief is on the way. Um, 
vaccinations are also helping improve the economic recovery. So we're we're hopeful that um, people will do the right thing and, and sign up for that, as as uh, AJ mentioned. Um, and the response and recovery continues to be a priority for us. We've established an ad hoc committee within the city council. So we're pretty excited about that. It offers a more uh, kind of targeted forum for folks to provide input, make recommendations on the response and recovery efforts, not just now, but even after we, we get through this recovery, how, how folks are, um, you know, getting that, that relief, either through small business relief, rental relief, eviction moratorium, and making sure that there's access, equity, transparency, and, and all of that. So we're excited about that committee. Um, let me know if you have any questions about that. Vaccinations continue to be a priority, as was mentioned. So if you know folks who are trying to sign up or struggling, there has been obviously some issues with uh, appointments. So our office is happy to help with that as well. Um, STBR ordinance obviously approved eight to one. So we are uh, hopeful that that puts us in a better place to to start to regulate and, and chip away at that that issue for all of our communities. Uh, excited to hear the discussion today on the agenda about quality of life issues, and, and we'll be happy to relay those issues to, to the council president. Um, a couple other things just wanted to mention quickly, Froud Street intersections, something that we're still talking to departments on, just wanted to mention that's on my radar. Um, appreciate the memo from the board on that and staying engaged for us on that too. Uh, vendors ordinance is still a major priority. We're working on that. Mayor's office is doing um, some outreach to the vendors and we're supporting those efforts. We'll be out there trying to uh, get the, the survey out that they've created and hopefully that'll garner some input before we make any uh, further actions to, to get that finally put to rest once and for all. Um, parking law enforcement's another thing we're working with the mayor's office on. The Ocean Beach parking lots, now that parking enforcement is back up and running, are, are something we're hearing about again and, and obviously wanting to get moving on. Uh, we are giving the mayor's office uh, a bit of a, 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 we're not giving them a hard time because we know they've only been in office for a couple months and we've just been bombarding them with our, our large requests, but this is a priority for us. And um, we're looking at the closure times and uh, gate closures. And we'll be getting a briefing from the Coastal Commission and Parks and Recs pretty soon on that. So just wanted to mention that as something that's ongoing, uh, as well as the OB peer damage, something that we hate to see closed. Um, and we're we're asking probably too often what what is going on with that, but Parks and Rec is informing us that they are assessing the damage. Um, it seems like it could be the same fix as last time where they just reinforce the, the structural like concrete that the the rails were attached to, um, but it may need more uh, more repairs than that. Obviously, we want a long term fix as well. So we're taking that community input back um, in those meetings. So those are the things I wanted to to share that we're we're keeping track of. Happy to answer questions if there's time, and hope everyone stays well. Yeah. So touching on the parking thing, there it, since we implemented that four uh, the four hour limit at the beach lot, there hasn't been any period of enforcement, has there? I think February 4th or around that time, I might begin the date wrong is when enforcement started up again. And okay. so now that that enforcement has begun, we're asking about that time limit, because if you remember, the time period is 2 a.m. to, I believe, 6 uh, a.m. And it's just is a very brief period of time at night. Um, so we are asking what the what the possibilities of making that earlier and including some mm -hmm. sort of closure barriers. Uh, but the four hour limit has also been implemented, correct? So signs are up there. So has there been enforcement or any citations around that? Or do I don't know about citations. I can get numbers for our next meeting um, just to see. I can chime in right. on that real quick. I did see a car in the parking lot this morning with a ticket on the windshield. So, yes, I yeah. do believe enforcement has begun. I don't, I don't have totals okay. or anything, so I can't share like <laughs> progress, but I do know that Parking enforcement, along with 72 hour and oversized vehicles is being enforced. Um, but as always, let us know if, if we need to uh, uh, echo those concerns to parking enforcement or however we can help. But as far as we know, uh, our crews are on it. We're supportive of them. And now we're just trying to figure out that time and closure issue for the longer term uh, fix. Great. Does anyone have any other questions for council member Campbell's office and Teddy? Our representative? He's over here on my screen. Sorry. <laughs> if I'm not pointing to him on yours. Okay. Uh, great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.
Yeah, thanks. And thanks for hanging around. Uh, okay, so let me just quickly go through what Coda sent me. So he sent an update about the peer as well. Um, nothing to really add to what Teddy said, except uh, that engineering and capital projects has been leading the effort to assess the structural condition of the peer. They're in the midst of that currently. Um, after the structural assessment is done, we will know what the options are and the full nature of the damages. Um, he also wanted to uh, update on business loans. Uh, so there's still, so the city's economic development department will be issuing business loans ranging from $25,000 to $95,000 to current to qualified businesses um, as part of the CARES Act. So this one comes with, I guess, a 3% fixed annual interest rate. I will drop it in the chat to a, uh, everyone. Okay. <laughs> so, um, if you're interested in applying for any small business loans through the CARES Act, that is a um, that was from Coda, who wanted me to pass that link along. Um, there's also still emergency rental assistance going on. So, anyone who needs that, or possibly have tenants who need that, uh, there is a link for you. Um, so, as you know, and this is probably touched on last month, the eviction moratorium has been extended um, until until the COVID-19 emergency declaration ends. Um, any unpaid rent that accumulates during this period and is not repaid will be converted to consumer debt. For residential tenants, the eviction ban will remain in effect until 60 days after the city's COVID-19 emer COVID emergency declaration is lifted. Um, and then for commercial tenants, the eviction ban will remain in effect through June 30th of 2021 or 60 days after the city emergency declaration is lifted, whichever comes first. Uh, so that is just more of a clear timeline about how long these eviction moratoriums will, uh, will stand. So it sounds like um, it's gonna go until the crisis is over and has been declared over. Uh, so that's good news for all of us tenants, I guess. Uh, and as far as school reopenings go, Mayor Todd Gloria pledges to keep working with stakeholders to get our students physically back to the classroom as quickly and safely as possible. San Diego Unified School District recently provided a clear timeline of a hybrid schedule on February on a February 23rd um, announcement, and they're they're aiming for a reopen in April. So uh, just stay posted with San Diego Unified Schools. Um, but as of this past Saturday, the teachers are uh, eligible for, for vaccines. So hopefully that'll, uh, you know, we hopefully we get enough teachers vaccinated and that'll help speed up the process. And this is actually something um, we were certainly going to mention. Uh, but the San Diego Library Foundation is starting their uh, library master plan um, planning. So I, I, I will be sending out uh, the link so everyone can go fill that in. And we're also going to have uh, the library come and present to us next week, both about the master plan and about uh, the Ocean Beach branch update. So um, we will put this on all of our social media pages. But if you want to take the library survey as soon as possible, uh, there is the survey for the library master plan. I would say any questions for the mayor's office, but I can't answer them for you guys. So um, that wraps up the mayor's updates. Thank you. I, do, I don't see Miller in the chat, so I'm going to go ahead and hop over to non-agenda public comment. Uh, I know Laura Dennison reached out to me. Laura, do you want to give a quick non-agenda public comment about the library? Or are you just here to listen in? Okay. <laughs> well, good to see you. Uh, is there anyone else wishing to make a non? Tracy? Yeah, hi. Um, so this is a little bit different than my commission stuff. So the commission stuff I'll mention at the end when we talk about commissions, but I just wanted to let everybody know that the San Diego Public Library is requiring or not requiring, requesting images from uh, the previous six months or the next six months that uh, they're entitled. It's a it's a project that they're entitling um, snapshot a photo journal of life during the pandemic. And they're basically asking for people to help them create a historical record for their archive. So they're accepting one to 10 images of how 
you have seen the pandemic and how you relate to it. And it can be abstract. It can be, you know, your family. It can be how you've been coping or whatever. And it's going to go into a permanent collection that the San Diego Public Library is going to, you know, utilize for historical references or just history in general. So I'm going to, I, I think it's a really amazing project that they're doing. And I know almost every one of you takes pictures and every one of you has, has been completely affected by COVID-19 and the quarantine. So this might be a really great opportunity to be a part of a historical collection with the San Diego Public Library. So I'm gonna post the link to the website in the chat. And if anybody is interested or has any further questions, they can reach out to me too. Awesome, cool, cool project. Um, great, does anyone else have any non-agenda public comment? Um, I do. This is George Lapala. I just hey, want to let you know that of the two teachers that I'm working with right now, one of them has been vaccinated. So they have actually started the process of vaccinating through San Diego Unified. Awesome. Great. Well, I know at least Newman and Andrew are probably excited about that. So let's keep those kids or keep those teachers getting vaccinated. Okay. Do, 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 do. I don't have the agenda in front of me. Do I have the um, I have a comment. Short... Yeah, go for it, Kevin. Um, so some of you may be aware there's a uh, campaign going on to uh, recall the council member Jennifer Camel. Um, I have uh, signed on to that effort and there are signature gatherers out uh, collecting signatures. There's a lot of a lot of ground to cover. Um, I would be happy to um, uh, hand out any of the uh, signature petitions or gather any of your guys's signatures. Um, but anyone interested can go on recallgen.com to uh, learn more about it. And there should be some signatures uh, uh, forms getting uploaded to that uh, website pretty soon. Thank you, Kevin. All right. Okay. Right. So we're going to jump into our first uh, agenda item. And this agenda item really came about after uh, Mayor Gloria came to our last CPC meeting, which is the meeting of all of the planning board chairs. So he you know, took questions a lot like he did when he was at our meeting. And I asked him about the quality of life metrics he would use to measure the efficacy of the short-term vacation rental ordinance when it gets implemented. The only quality of life metric he really mentioned was the amount of police calls that are made for nuisance requests, you know, large parties or large gatherings or, um, you know, something going on at an Airbnb that we don't like. You know, I don't think that is the only quality of life metric we should be measuring the efficacy of this ordinance about by. I, ha I did send some pr preliminary ideas to his staff, but I did also want to open it up to the community and obviously the board who's worked so hard on this. Uh, to just kind of figure what we should be measuring to see if this ordinance is having the desired impacts that it needs. Uh, some of the ideas I threw out were uh, monitoring the number of naturally affordable housing rentals that are existing in Ocean Beach as well as Pacific Beach because we do have a large number of them. Uh, and then also, um, oh goodness, the, the amount of, uh, I don't know how it would be measured, but I would love to see the amount of displacement caused by this uh, about rent rental units being taken off the market, then converted into Airbnb or back the other way. Uh, how many people give up the Airbnb game and go back into long term renting? So I wanted to throw it out to the board because I, I know you guys have thought a lot about this, about what other possible metrics we should be using and then maybe get a motion because then I can go and gather, you know, other support and have a little bit of more of a push behind this because the second reading will come up and, and I'm sure that everyone is interested in how to measure, you know, how well our government is working. So, yeah, Virginia. Okay. Uh, we should keep a close watch on the number of elementary school children in the community. If uh, having an elementary school is uh, very important to a community. So. I would just expand that to all schools, elementary through high school. Why not? Yeah. 
Oh, sorry. I saw Anthony's hand up too. Uh, yeah, Andrea, I, I agree with you. Um, one of the biggest uh, metrics that we could use, especially, you know, when it comes to the, our purview of the planning board is, is affordable housing. Um, I don't know how difficult it would be to have a 1 to 1 relation you know, ratio relationship to. Uh, vacation rental and affordable housing losses or additions. Maybe it's all anecdotal, but if there's some way somehow we could. Be able to measure that and report that, um, you know, we know how many housing units there are and will be um, roughly how many have been removed from. Um, the housing market affordable at least and, um, and then maybe with a permitting system do another count or census of those to see, you know, if this ordinance actually does have the effect. Like you said, the efficacy of it and if it, if it does make a, a positive impact in, a, in better affordable housing, I think that's. Personally, for me, I think that's the, the biggest um, part that we, as a planning board, we can play. I mean, that's that's one of the levers that we have is, is to make housing affordable. Um, you know, the police, I think, although I like the, the, the police nuisance calls, um, they, they fall more into a, a day to day thing, but the affordable housing, I think is, is really long term. And uh, is a bigger impact. So I would yeah, like to see I that. thought just using police nuisance calls as a met, uh, quality of life metric kind of really missed the point of why we are opposed to short term vacation rentals. Of course, you know, no one wants to really live next to a party house, but our, our overarching goals are to make sure that our community stays affordable to renters. And also, I would argue, first time home buyers. Um, I was going to, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say, I was going to no, say you mentioned. So rentals. I just want to make and, sure that uh, we continue to have a voice in this process and are, are still yeah. advocating because Joe LaCava, I don't know if any of you guys watched the council hearing, did advocate for putting um, an affordable housing kind of tax or, or addendum on this to have the city either, I guess you could either buy up affordable housing or you could convert more landlords into being affordable housing and have more money for voucher vouchers. <laughs> so if it if we do start to see an impact, and that's why I want to make sure we're tracking the numbers of the, the NOAA, the num naturally occurring affordable housing units, so that if we do see that this is really, really getting, you know, a lot of just driving up rent prices, then maybe we revisit that policy proposal that Joe put out there. Yeah, I, I know anecdotally, my, uh, the, the, the property next to me, um, they just listed, they're about to list their house for sale. That was an Airbnb before COVID and now it's turned into long-term rental. Now they're selling it. So just, you know, off anecdotally, I don't know if that, if the ordinance has a played a role in that or not, but it'd be interesting to see. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Kevin, and that's the whole point. We want to make sure that these are actively being tracked. Kevin. Um, so the challenge I see here measuring the impact of this the existing condition has not been measured in drafting and passing this ordinance so you know and from their own from their own words we don't know how many there are in, until we vote for this and enact a law so um these metrics as far as how many units or affordable housing units they have to be something that can be compared with something that we was a known quantity prior uh, you know, if, if the NOAA units, the, the naturally affordable units is a quantity that's known, sure, you know, census data on population of full time residents, that's that's known prior. Now, that's a, obviously that's a every 10 year kind of deal. Right. Um, so keep that in mind. You can't really look at what these units were before because the city has to get a third party software company to do that work and they really have not done that or they haven't shared that. Um, I would say that there was discussion about grandfathering in some of these. So that would sort of give a window into how many are you know, pre-existing hosts versus new hosts. Um, I, know there, I know there is certainly a lot of turnover within that uh, industry, there's a lot of Probably half of them are, are ones that sort of rotate year to year. Um, and then the other half or so are, you know, in it for the long haul. So keep that in mind 
you know, we don't really have a lot to go on to compare the sort of the initial condition to. Okay, great. Thank you. I do see Chris's hand up. I see Tracy's hand up and then Virginia. Oh, and Andrew. Okay. So I'm going to go Chris first and then we'll pop around. That's how my score is. Yeah. I mean, so my comment is, I think it's challenging or problematic to look at, um, an increase in naturally affordable housing uh, as a tracking method, just because there's other efforts underway, like accessory dwelling units and those types of things that would supposedly, or, you know, the, the intention is they will grow that supply. So I think um, it'd be more to the former point that Andrea, you mentioned is how do we track maybe the, the, the Airbnbs and the rentals that go off market and become uh, long term rentals, um, but that kind of segues back to what Kevin just said. If we don't know what our starting line is, you know, how do we, how do we know how many, um, you know, vacation rentals are are reduced from that starting point? Um, I think that's the best way to 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 go after what you're trying to accomplish here. But um, I think we need that baseline somehow to begin with, or increased. Well, we do have a baseline. So for the two metrics that have been thrown out, we definitely have baselines for them. Uh, we know how many kids are enrolled in the public schools and we'll, and the housing commission does a study of naturally occurring affordable housing units. So that's just based on the market rate rent or the, the rate of rent that's being charged per like one bedrooms or two bedrooms. So we know both of these things and they are both um, very easily measured. They are, they're already measured uh, each month. Not those as much, Andrea, as how what is the current supply of vacation rentals and how 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 is that reduced as a result of this ordinance? That's what I was trying to get at. Yeah. Um, and if and that is and like Kevin said, we don't know that. So focusing on something that we do know, which was his point, and then also that is what we're had always been concerned with to start this whole conversation. We were concerned that our affordable units were being converted, that people were being displaced, uh, that the you know lower kind of fixer upper houses were being bought by flippers and investors as opposed to single families uh, that then maybe enrolled their kids at school. Tracy. Andrew, and then I'll hop back to Virginia. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Uh, and just to kind of, I guess, piggyback off of, um, I think was it Kevin mentioned it. Um, I think it is really important, Chris kind of echoed it too. It is it is really important that we use data that, or reference information that we're not just inventing uh, and also not just have to create a system to invent, create, invent a system to capture data. Um, I think one of the few ways we could probably keep the city accountable would be to use um, tax tax filing data. Um, and I don't know if there's a specific data point within our filed taxes that would point to a healthy economy or you know a diverse community or you know whether a home is specifically short term vacation rental or not. But I would gather. Um, you know, if if a landlord has multiple houses and multiple of and multiple units are uh, allocated for short term vacation rentals, you're going to have one tax filing versus potentially 15 tax filings for a resident. So I would kind of look for that data and you could even look at the amount of tax filings within our or what comes. Um, and I would even use a baseline as starting at looking at data as far back as whenever, you know, I guess we could argue this, but whenever the apps took, um, VRBO type apps took, um, got under underway. So, you know, if we looked at the last five years prior to when VRBO and, you know, HomeAway or whoever created their app, let's look at those five years prior and five years, yeah, you know, and then everywhere going forward and see how the trends have shifted. Are you referring to uh, TOT, Andrew? Well, TOT is a little bit different, I think, because that's going to apply to hotels. I'm really looking at, um, you know, we all file our personal taxes and person, you know, business, if we have them, business taxes, if we own small businesses. But for the most part, um, what is the city making off of us? You know, uh, what is the state making off of us? And that data, I'm sure the city is going to have access to it. And if that concept could get traction, maybe, maybe you could access statewide records as well. 
Yeah, I don't know where that income tax goes. I mean, I pay income tax on my my long term rental, and does the city know how much I pay? Obviously, that also is based on my income as well uh, from other sources. So, you know, my tax rate. So, that seems like a tough metric to to gather. But I, I don't know what they have access to. Yeah, and so that, that was my suggestion. Yeah, an interesting point. So, kind of tracking or and also tracking medium income and how it's rising and to it per neighborhood per census tract. Were you also making that suggestion? Yeah, and I mean, I think there could be a lot of really interesting data points to dig into, and I think the council member's office or the mayor's office could probably, or some, I don't know, social scientists could probably tell you what would be most most relevant. But yeah, I mean, average incomes based on um, uh, rising cost of living. So I, I don't know, obviously it wouldn't be empirical data. Like you'd have to kind of weight it based on cost of living adjustments and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah, I think there could be really, some really interesting data to glean off of to see if the, you know, what VRBOs are doing to a community. Yeah, and I, I just, I would hate for this ordinance to get enacted without us even thinking about data collection on it and how it's being impacted or leaving that up to, um, you know, outside social scientists, as you say, to study years down the road, like how has this impacted, you know, tourist centric economies in California, um, you know, somebody's thesis 10 years from now, I'd rather that not happen. I'd rather and, that be the city looking at but it. There could even be some really good um, comparisons where you look at Ocean Beach, Mission Beach, and then you look at, you know, Lemon Grove. And while the average income might be different, you can look at trend lines. So, um, you know, I don't know. Yeah, how quickly they're rising um, in comparison to non-tourist neighborhoods. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Uh, Virginia? What I would like to see is, I know Kevin, Kevin did the work tracking the uh, number of rentals available outside of the law in previous years. And I would like the city to so be be aware of that, and if they could compare the number of permits that they've issued or licenses that they've issued to the number of rentals listed on these websites, then we could have some idea whether there truly is a reduction or an increase or any change in the number of vacation rentals offered. Yeah. Yeah, the city, I recall, discussed um, the the third third party compliance. I guess we'd call it um, basically not taking Airbnb's word for it and hiring an outside contractor. Uh, they have dabbled in that a little bit. <clears throat> um, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. You know, it costs money to do. Um, I think it's absolutely necessary, uh, but um, if they do that, then certainly those outfits could compare metrics, uh, the same metrics they had prior to the law being passed. <clears throat> um, and I mean, for example, I have data going back you know, five or six years on on that, where they've literally scraped all that off Airbnb. So they, you know, they can do the same exact thing. And, and that can be compared. I, I, I could compare them. So that that certainly is available, um, even if the city doesn't retain one of these outfits, really. But frankly, they didn't pay attention to that going into this ordinance. So, you know, despite a lot of us screaming and shouting, so I don't know if getting them to pay attention to it after the fact. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, Tracy. Um, I, I'm. I haven't been paying a, a lot of attention to like some of the enforcement mechanisms or data collection mechanisms that people are using. But maybe this is a question for for Teddy. But is there going to be something that is enacted that requires these host sites? to report back to the city 
like how many Airbnbs they actually have and how many are being rented out. And, you know, I mean, that would be a starting point. At least we could kind of get a better idea of how many we have if these companies were forced or regulated to the point where we, you know, we could get that information. Cause right now, I don't know if they're seeing it as like a privacy issue, but I, you know, I don't know. Does anybody have that that answer for me? I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Anybody, Bueller? I'll give it a shot if Teddy doesn't want to. Okay, Teddy. <laughs> but basically, my understanding is, Airbnb will go to any and all lengths to protect the identity and location of these properties <clears throat> for several reasons. Um, the hosts like the anonymity and also Airbnb doesn't want to give the city any more information than they absolutely have to that may be used against them, right? They're not going to go and say, hey, here's, here's 8,000 uh, of our listings. Oh, but only 6,000 are allowed. Oh, oops. Yeah, so so they, they guard that very closely. The ordinance itself, um, it sort of puts that on the hosts to report that information and report how many nights were booked and keep those records uh, in case the city, um, I don't know if it actually requires them to report it, but it requires the host to keep those records and that the city can probably audit that. The city also has a current agreement with Airbnb and uh, VRBO where they can audit records, but they're anonymous. They're anonymized. There's no addresses or, or host info on there. So they wouldn't be able to really line that up against their own database. <clears throat> so under the new ordinance, the city will have a database. But as far as getting you know the platforms to provide all the data, I, I'm not seeing that in this ordinance. And Airbnb has sued other cities to, to resist providing any of that information. Yeah, Tracy, if I could chime in too, Kevin pretty much encompassed everything there. Um, it, it was discussed during the the council uh, meeting on this, um, how to get the platforms to come to the table to provide that data sharing. Um, it's something that as we get that fee structure in place and um, kind of the, the permit structure in place by October, we'll be asking um, how that would actually work. As Kevin mentioned, they're not just opening up their books for us to look at. Um, they they have algorithms, they have their secret sauce that they keep proprietary information to themselves. We obviously want to work with them to try to um, call out bad actors. The Office of the City Attorney has a lot of uh, tools in the tool belt to go after those bad actors through subpoenas and, and audits like Kevin mentioned. Um, but it'll be an ongoing um, discussion. I think we're in a better place to work with those platforms. Now we have something that is workable, um, but it'll be an ongoing discussion as it's, it's, it's a private entity. They have data, uh, and it's not open to the public. So, so it, it does become more challenging, but Kevin did kind of synopsize that pretty well. So just want to add that. So it seems like something that needs to be like pushed further up the chain then, you know, I mean, if it's, if it's only San Diego, that's fighting for that, then we're not going to have a lot of pull, but if it starts going up to, you know, California is going to require it, then, you know, I don't know. I just think it's, it's a valid thing to fight for because otherwise we're not going to have any real data. So. Well, San Francisco does require it and Airbnb did sue them and they lost. So. A uh don't see any own in. And when Elise Lowe was questioned about whether or not uh, Airbnb wanted to track if people were illegally listed rentings, they of course pushed it back onto us because why would they want to do that themselves? That's more work for them. Uh, and they don't even, you know, clean their own hotel rooms that they make money off of on the site. So why would they want to do any work? It seems a little silly to me that you know, a city in crisis has to take on more of a regulatory framework to scale in a biz, a billion dollar business. Uh, so, but that's why we're having this conversation today. And that's why uh, the ordinance will come for a second reading and why it's still, and it should still be top of mind 
uh, to think about this because we we have to live with the ordinance uh, and we're going to be the ones who, you know, may like it in the future or may hate it and be fighting to change it. So I, we just want to keep on top of this. Uh, back to so so getting circling back to the metrics that have been mentioned i know it, obviously public school enrollment would be tracked every year does i i know the housing commission does studies on you know rent prices are though teddy do you know if those are done every year or if it's just a bi-yearly thing not sure no. okay um okay because obviously if we prefer it then to be on a yearly basis uh, to keep to keep up with this new new ordinance that will have some sort of impact whether positive or negative on our housing supply so and that's why i think getting uh, a motion passed today and getting something you know out there is important i also had this idea about um because we're all volunteers who are actively engaged in our community. You know, we sit on the planning board. A lot of our friends sit on the town council boards. You know, Main Street Association, Nicole when is on the CDC. Uh, so yeah, I, I would want, I was also thinking about a metric that measures how you know strong and civically engaged these organizations still are and how the nonprofits are thriving. Because obviously, if enough of our housing gets cannibalized and we don't have people actually living in our neighborhoods, uh, the health of these organizations might also start to dwindle and go down. Uh, so we obviously keep records of what are who our people are in DSD requires that, but checking in with the town councils and the other community organizations might be a good idea to just keep a pulse on how um, how how active everyone is and what's actually happening. I also uh, was thinking about tracking commercial rents because uh, one of the things I know is a big concern for myself is as it becomes more touristy and it be, and you know rents become more desirable, they'll start to go up, and our you know smaller mom and pop shops might start to feel the crunch and start getting a turnover. Uh, so it'd be interesting to also look at the commercial districts and how they're being impacted as well. God, I do sound like I'm writing a thesis on this. Uh, but I, I think these are all known quant quantities and not out of the realm of possibility uh, to ask to be kept track of. I would I would offer up that um, any any motion we do today kind of is as little in detail and let the city itself figure out how they're going to do whatever metric they want to do, you know, to, to, to do this study. I, like I said before, I think it's, it's imperative on a planning board that we want to focus on affordability of housing, availability of housing and, um, and leave it at that, you know, say, tell us, Hey, you've got to yeah. figure out this is, you've got to report back to us. This, this ordinance has this effect positive or negative and how you do it is, is up to you. Man. Let the. And that's a good point too, Anthony. Abroad, do you want to try your hand at something? I okay. Uh, I'll, I'll make a motion that we, as a as a board, recommend strongly recommend to the to the city council that any that there is a, f a feedback mechanism. I guess you could say. I don't know if it's that or a annual or quarterly reports on um, on housing stock, affordability, uh, and other quality of life issues. I don't know how, I'm not sure how else I could make it more <laughs> generic than that or basic. Anybody else wanna try to? Yeah, I really just that? wanna make it clear that, you know, police calls and how often the police are responding to those calls is not an appropriate quality of life. Um, how about other so you've got rent, you've got you have stock, you've got uh elementary through through secondary school enrollment and other metrics relating yeah, okay. to the impact of STVR uses on, should we say coastal communities or Ocean Beach? 
We, yeah, well, we, I would say heavily tourist impacted communities. Well, oh, pretty much in the coastal zone. Well, North Park gets hit with a lot of stuff too, and I never want to downplay their pain. You know, they have a whole okay. apartment building okay. with these. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Coastal and other tourism impacted communities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I would add, <clears throat> we should clarify this is by community planning area. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> I would also include in that uh, TOT revenue for that planning within that planning area. Um, uh, grandfathered uh, STR licenses, if any, if they go that route. Um, I think the other ones were covered. I don't know how. Uh, Nat the NOAA units are defined exactly. I have a general idea, but um, I would be I would specifically call out the 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 NOAA designation when you, when we refer to the affordable housing, so they don't confuse it with yeah subsidized housing. No. I'm kind of keeping I'm kind of keeping track of what you guys are talking about, but um, it, the the motion just keeps getting like well, bigger and bigger and bigger. So. Um, I'm just going to post. So I'm just posting like the things that you guys are talking about, and then maybe somebody could make a motion based on the things that you guys are talking about. Okay. Virginia, <laughs> you have your hand up. I think actually that the police, the number of police calls is an appropriate metric because it does put a strain on our resources if there are police calls. And I'm sure there are other ways, like trash collection, um, other factors that the vacation rentals are using those, and we need to be aware of it. Yeah, of course, yeah. we don't want to exclude it. We just don't think it's, I, or at least I just didn't think it was the only appropriate metric. No, for not the only one, no, not by any means, but not by any means, no. It's not the only, uh, it's not the only strain that they put on our um, community resources either. That's a good way to phrase it. Uh, we could say, um, you know, acknowledging the the possible strain that will be put on beach coastal communities as well as of other heavily tra tourist tracted communities. Uh, we ask that the ordinance use TOT revenues to study um, certain quality of life metrics, including, but not limited to, uh, the stock of NOAA housing, uh, the cost of house, the housing stock in general, uh, public school enrollments, uh, as well as police nuisance calls and commercial rent. What about code enforcement calls? I mean, not all these are going to be police calls. You know, yeah. I would see uh, 20 people booking into a house next to me. I'm not calling the police necessarily. I might be calling whatever hotline they give us. So I would, I would say just, I guess, STR related calls and reports. Also, the uh, get it done app, if you guys aren't aware, I, it seems like somebody shows up in the morning at the city and then starts routing all those reports. Uh, some of them may go directly to departments, but they better figure that out <clears throat> if they if they think they're going to get after hours, uh, provide an after hours mechanism. That's currently not really an option with the get it done app. Yeah, interesting. I mean, yeah, I think. Excuse me. Was it was 20, 24 hour code enforcement was included in this ordinance? Am I right, Teddy? Was that? 
Uh, I believe so. I'd have to confirm, though. Okay. Tracy, did you happen to jot down what I said? Or <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, I, I did. I did. I got. Okay. I got some of it, but it's going to need. Um, it probably uh, editing. It's, missing, it's probably missing some stuff. So here you go. <laughs> I read that as Coastal Commission, not City Council. Um, yeah, I would do following quality of life metrics to the ordinance. Following, uh, ask that the City Council add the following quality of life metrics to the what ordinance? The I'm going to do STR. I think it's, is it just STR or is it STVR as Teddy? Or is there a name? Did it have an official name? They're called STROs. I think it was um, the agenda was the code update. Okay. Okay. Well, hopefully they'll know what that means. <laughs> I mean, should we should we list it as STRO or STVRs, which is what we've been recall calling it all this time as STVRs? I would do STR. <clears throat> I think that they'll understand that. Okay. All right, one more time. All right, because Anthony has one too. Frankenstein and motions here. So one more time, look at the motion. Okay. Because Anthony's is report on STR impact and on economic and quality of life issues within each planning area, including availability of affordable housing, um, policing, T I think TOT public school enrollments and civic engagement must be done on a frequency where reasonable adjustments to the ordinance can be made. Yeah. So are we, which are we voting on two? Uh, or are we trying to Frankenstein? I think we're two? trying to like merge them into one. Yeah. 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 Can you, uh, can you post Anthony's in the chat? So I can grab it. It is right in between. It's sandwiched in between the two you put. Gotcha. It went by so quick. I didn't even see it. Yeah. So they're trying to be in impact economic. You need to spell out these acronyms. S T V R S T O. T, what are they? Whatever would you for Well, it's easy enough for me to tourism, occupancy, tax, or um, I'm sorry, transient. <laughs> All I think about is tourists. Okay, transient. That's occupancy. why you spell it out. Occupancy tax. So that's an that's an Anthony's. So I'm not exactly sure. Like, are we uh, again? Are we gonna vote on which motion we want? <laughs> vote on which motion we want, and then motion. Uh, no, I think we can kind of. They're pretty much saying the same thing. Um, so, so I think it's important to get the acknowledging the possible strain, and then put that with. Um, at his Anthony's endpoint is important, um, and then the beginning of Tracy's point is important, and then the middle is kind of the same. So I think uh, it would go acknowledging the possible strain that is put on beach communities as well as other tourist communities. We ask that the city council add the following quality of life metrics to the STR ordinance. Stock of it's N O H A naturally occur no. Naturally occurring affordable housing. So it ends with an H. 
uh, housing costs, cost of housing, public school enrollment, um, increase on rents, both commercial and residential uh, <laughs> and um, STVR rate related nuisance calls to do we want to say to the police and code enforcement uh, with in the period um, these must be done on a frequency where reasonable adjustments to the ordinance can be made and, and you missed the TOT income by TOT income. I didn't see that one. Yeah. TOT revenue. Oh, and, uh, using the TOT funds. Where do uh, oh, where no, TOT, TOT revenue? TOT revenue, TOT, by, revenue. TOT revenue is something that should be tracked because it's the most direct indicator of sort of the quantity of these things. Even if Airbnb is listing illegal units, they're still collecting and remitting TOT on that, as far as we know. Where do you want that part to go? Just in, in with all the other commas. In with all the <laughs> STR related nuisance calls to the police and code enforcement and TOT. What, 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 how do you want to phrase that? TOT revenue. Revenue. Yeah. Be done on a frequency where reasonable adjustments to the ordinance can be made. This should be or must be. I would also add the trash pickup. Because in in uh, Mission Beach, they where they have vacation rentals to an extreme, they asked for increased trash pickup. So, Andrea, did you say that you wanted to change must be done to should be done? I had should, yeah. Okay. One more time here. Boom. Kaboom. So, we had this from Anthony. Say Anthony made the motion. Um, I'll second it. To keep it moving, to keep it because I know Kevin's dying to present. Andrew, yeah. Could I make a quick question before we vote to approve? Just right. a clarifying point. Point. Yeah. I'm not a TOT expert, uh, and Kevin, I, I support your idea, but just to double check. Does the city make distinction on where TOT comes from? Because mm -hmm. as far as I know, people pay the TOT tax. It's not necessarily like this is TOT from Hilton and this is TOT yeah. from VRBO or VRBO owner. So if this is just referencing TOT, that's that's an interesting you know data point, but it might not represent the sub community of VRBO mm -hmm. taxpayers. Yeah. The answer to your question is yes, the city does distinguish. I don't know how exactly, okay. um, but they do distinguish that. And so if that's the case that that might, we might need that that signifier that's TOT X. It's not it's that, TOT yeah. general yeah. funds. Yeah. Yeah. Short term. Perfect. TOT revenue from, from short term. Short -term. Yeah. Vacation rentals. Okay. Was good. Does that include like a, the ADU conversation? Just a question. So, because then you might have to parse out like what type of rental you're talking about. Just well, no, it's, it's just uh, pushing from say like the Sunset Cliffs in. Mm -hmm. It's an actual hotel. Although they list on Airbnb also, so there's going to be a, a some overlap, but uh, they, uh, yeah, it's it's just to distinguish from the hotel revenue. Okay. Yeah, ADUs. Sorry, ADUs that were that have used um, government subsidies to be built still are not. 
those are those were still excluded from the ordinance, correct? Anthony can't use his ADU as a short term vacation rental. Correct. Just making sure for the TOT yeah. discussion. I don't know. So it may have been actually confusing. I just was trying to, it has to been clarify. No, it's okay. Yeah, Teddy, so that Anthony, was confusing. We'll move in. Sorry, guys. Anthony will move into his uh, subsidized companion unit and then he'll list his cottage on uh, Airbnb. So he's good. I'll, I'll live in my closet and uh, <laughs> rent out the rest of my life. Um, I have the latest one copied, but just so I have the right one, if one of you wouldn't mind sending me it, just so it's the right one. Of course. Um, yeah, so not we, we need to take a vote on it, though. Yeah. Um, does any, is there any discussion for the motion? It is currently the last one. Um, I can read it. Yeah. Okay. For the record. Okay. Yeah. For the record, acknowledging the possible strain that is put on beach communities as well as other tourist and tourist communities, we ask that the community council, uh, community council, the city council add the following quality of life metrics to the short term rental ordinance: stock of naturally occurring affordable housing, cost of general housing, public school enrollments, increase on rents, both commercial and residential. STVR related nuisance calls to the police and code enforcement, TOT revenues from STVRs, um, increase in trash pickups. This should be done on a frequency where reasonable adjustments to the ordinance can be made. I'm going to copy that into my notes too. All right. Any discussion? Okay, Tracy. Do, is there any public comment? Oh, okay. <laughs> Gotta keep some of the rules, right? <laughs> Don't see any public comment. All right. Okay. So I will um I'll take roll. Uh so anyways, Anthony first did that, Andrea seconded it, and I'm calling roll. Anthony. Yes. Andrea. Yes. Andrew. Yes. Craig. Yes. Chris. Yes. George. Where'd George go? Oh, he's holding oh, a thumbs up. Th thumbs up. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jane. Went to Niagara Falls. Jane. Jane. Yes. Yes. Uh, Jenna. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Nicole. Yes. Newman. Yes. Richard. Yes. Tom. Yes. Uh, Virginia. Where are you? Virginia. Yes. Is that a yes? Thank you. And I'll vote yes. Unanimous. <clears throat> How many people do we have now? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 15 people. All right, cool. Motion passes. Quick, quick follow up. Um, I, I understand the intention of the motion that we just passed, and this question is maybe for Andrea, Kevin, or Teddy. Um, what are some of the next steps, though, related to the ordinance itself and sort of opportunities for further discussion and helping sort of get to the point where we're talking about enforcement and the final, you know, stipulations of the ordinance? What are sort of the, the next steps if you guys can help us? Yeah. Understand that. So, I don't know from this. So, Teddy can talk about city council office, uh, but the bill, the ordinance will come up for a second reading where further <laughs> amendments are uh, proposed. So, on my end, I'm personally going to take this to the CPC and community planning committee and contact the fellow chairs of the coastal planning boards to see how they feel about this and what kind of momentum we can get behind this. Uh, so now that we have an official motion, I can I can shop it around to other boards and see how much support we can get to then go uh, and hopefully get this through on something uh, on the second reading, which I think Teddy was saying kind of earlier might be coming around October time. Teddy, do you know when the second reading would be? 
So second reading is more procedural. That's just basically, mm -hmm. I think that's just a matter of agenda. I don't know when that date is going to be. Um, any file item that goes through council goes through first reading and second reading and, and sometimes the second reading is put on consent. I haven't heard about that second reading date, but what I what I was referring to earlier was the October date um, that the ordinance sets out for basically the administration to come back with a fee structure and with like a little bit more of the administrative regulations that are going to be put in place. Mm -hmm. um, the council basically directed all of these departments to say, hey, <laughs> we have a, a huge problem and we want to address it and we're directing you to figure it out. Here's what we can offer. Here's like, you know, the, the, the skeleton. Um, but here's what we want addressed, and it's up to you departments to go and, and, and find the best uh, 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 plan for that and report back to us what that will look like so that we can approve it and advise on that as the policy is implemented, right? Uh, council created this. It's up to administration to enforce and implement the policy now. Um, the October date, I, I want to say it's the 12th or the 15th. It's slipping my mind off the top of my head, so I'm sorry. Um, if I looked at a calendar, I could probably uh, uh, pinpoint it, but it's on that week and that's the date that they're going to come back with the initial fee structure. The thereafter, it still doesn't go into effect until the following summer. Um, so it's still going to give residents, it's going to, it's going to give, uh, the platforms, um, it's going to give everyone time to adjust to it. So we've been getting. A lot of questions about, like, how do I follow all the rules right now at this point? Um, we're telling folks they still have time. We're still sorting out all the, like, final details about how this is going to actually be implemented now. Um, and, and as was reiterated during those council meetings and during this item was, was made clear, this is just, like, the first step. We're going to be uh, in these meetings monthly. Um, so if there's, you know, there's opportunities between these monthly meetings that you want to provide input, <clears throat> consider me a resource, consider me a, a, a relay point to the office, um, but stay engaged. You know, this was obviously just a, a very first pass at getting something started. And now we have a forum to have these conversations. Um, so the October date is the important one. And then I believe it's June 2022 is when all of this should be in full effect. So between now and then there's time for the board to make recommendations. Um, and then even after that, It'll be brought back every year, um, so it's a huge priority to the city. It's not going to be a one and done. We've we're, we're finished. Uh, this will be something the city has to manage uh, going forward. Uh, so, so just to kind of preface all of that with the fact that this is a new, a new uh, program. It'll be a new <clears throat> uh, task that the city has to to grapple with, and so we'll be our office will be working with them. But you know. As, as, that's kind of where the timeline goes between now and next year and implementation. Um, but stay engaged with us. I'm happy to provide you more info or connect you to the right people because there's a lot going on, a lot of people working on it. So, um, right. Thanks, Terry. That, that's why I asked, and that, that, that schedule is helpful to understand. Um, and I, I knew that October was the, the next really major step, but recognizing that there will be some administrative hurdles to figure this all out, I appreciate the last comment there. And I never feel like it's too late, right? And um, you know, so we've got this ordinance, and I think it's 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 still on us to sort of figure out in collaboration. Well, what are the challenges, and how do we overcome those? And so, um, yep, uh, we'll I we'll plan to be engaged with you. So thank you. I know you will. Thank you. And when that fee structure comes out, is that also when the lottery structure will be coming out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. all of the. I think it's like the pre preliminary. Here's what it's going to actually look like the fee structure, sure. the lottery system. Um, there was talk about including a system to prioritize good actors, those that have been in this and kind of playing by the rules, paying TOT, um, that sort of thing. So um, October is is still months away, but can go by quick. So I'll, I'll obviously between now and then provide as much info to you all as I can. Thank you. I'm sure we'll be asking. <laughs> okay, uh, so hopping to our next agenda item, uh, we do have a board members project being presented. 
Uh, so if memory serves correctly, I think Anthony, you did present your own project, but then you left the room when we took the vote. Okay, so I'm going to have Kevin present his project and then we'll kick him off, I guess. Uh, and then we'll uh, decide what we want to do about it and let him know when he can rejoin the meeting. Uh, so, Kevin, are you prepared to present? Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Um, I'm using two different devices to do this, so hopefully this works. Um, so, I have applied for a coastal development permit on my property here in Ocean Beach. This is located at 4673 Del Monte and 4675 Del Monte. Um, ignore the numbers on the screen. That's Google screwing it up. Um, or maybe I've been living in the wrong house this entire time. So so this is a satellite view showing the uh, front house here on the property. Uh, that's a two bedroom, one bath. It has parking access from the street. And then within the same lot, this is a 7,000 square foot lot. There is a currently a 450 square foot one bedroom, one bath unit. Uh, that's accessed off the alley and that has parking as well. So the project. And I'll, I'll show the plans in a minute, but the project entails. Demoing this small unit in the back. And putting a new structure, and this is going to be a little bit different footprint. It's going to be pushed towards the alley a bit more, and then up uphill a little bit more. Uh, so it's going to be kind of a a quarter of what this was. It's going to overlap, but it's going to be pushed to that that direction uphill more. Um, and that's going to be a three car garage access from the alley, with a one bedroom companion unit on top. And so that would, um, that one's a 532 square feet, the, the unit up on top. And there would be no changes to the existing front dwelling unit. So, and I have a couple photos here uh, to show sort of closer up. This is a side view. Uh, this is looking towards the ocean. You can see the neighboring property here. Uh, that's actually a three story. Uh, this will be about the same width as that, but but two stories tall with a you know unit on top of a garage. Um, this is looking towards the alley. Uh, so you can see the units kind of sunken down into the yard here. The, the yard is on a slope. Uh, there's another neighbor here that has a two story uh, on the uphill side. And I've let them know about the meeting tonight. I didn't. Uh, I didn't get any pushback from them, though. I don't see them on here. Um, this is the street side uh, looking down the hill, uh, down Del Monte. Uh, there's a retaining wall. This is all going to stay uh, as part of the project. The sidewalk has to be repaired. Uh, so I'm going to be I don't know if it's going to be the entire thing or. If I can do it in two sections. Um, what else do we have here? This is the front of the existing that's going to remain. Um, again, from the front, you can see that back house sort of towering over that. There is a uh, Canary Island palm here that after I took this photo, uh, the palm weevils killed that, the city cut it down. And so I need to put a new street tree in. I don't know exactly what that's going to be at this point. Uh, I asked the neighbors and they kind of didn't really have a preference there. I was a little hesitant to put in shade trees on the front because they're they can be messy and and uh, it'll sort of block off the uh, the views of the neighbors above the hill. I would like to do some some shade trees in the actual the yard between the units instead for privacy, um, and then maybe put some. I think they'll allow me to do some palm trees in the front. Um, so that's that's not settled yet. Um, I am through the cycle comments with exception of some environmental reports. Um, they may or may not require me to do a landscaping plan. I'm not certain yet on that. Uh, technically, it's a single family development because it's a unit plus a companion unit. 
Um, so I'm not sure about that yet. So that's that's what's remaining on the cycle issues. And of course, the uh, planning board recommendation is also something I, I need to get. So I'm going to show the drawings here. These are the same that were presented to the project review committee. Uh, my responses to uh, plan check since then have just been in you know writing responses. We're able to satisfy most of their of their asks. Uh, so this outlines the actual project information. Hopefully you guys can read the text on here. Um, so this shows the square footage. Uh, we have a 7,000 square foot lot. The structures were built in 1945 and 1950. And the we proposed can't, we, we can't see your um, other your your other. Oh, um, oh sorry, I, I didn't change the uh, share. Let me see here. Do, 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 do. How do I do that? Share content. Adobe. Probably have to stop sharing that and reshare. There you go. How's that? Behind the window. Oh no! It shows. Is it showing you guys too? Oh, that's terrible. Let me uh, see if there's. I didn't know you could do two at a time. That sounds like a terrible idea. All right, stop sharing the Google. Give this a minute. <clears throat> I'm actually watching on my phone and the sharing is uh, looking a little messy here. I'm going to unshare uh, both of these. And then I'm going to reshare the Adobe file. Also, um, just a reminder, all the plans are on the, right next to the meeting agenda. So if you want to be able to zoom in, I always have them pulled up for myself. All right, let's try this. This is working well enough. So um, here's the actual project info I was talking about. Uh, 7,000 square foot lot, 1945 and 1950, they were built. Um, the total height up to the peak as a pitched roof is, is actually 26 feet um, because it's on the slope from the, the lowest point of the existing grade is 26 feet. Um, but you'll see the uh, elevations, you know, from the the upper side of that slope, it's it's more like uh, 22 feet. Um, so the existing and new square footage is all here. Uh, the resulting on the entire lot, including the garage and dwelling unit space, will result in a FAR of 0.34, and the maximum allowed is 0.75. Um, the uh, landscaping, uh, parking. Uh, parking actually requires uh, no parking for the new companion unit uh, because it's within the transit priority area. Um, and then the existing front house requires 1.75 or a total of 1.75. This is actually providing four spaces. So no issue there. Um, setbacks are standard 15, 20 in front. Uh, four foot on the side. I'm not actually building out to these setbacks. Those are just what's what's allowed. Um, let me try to show you the, the important stuff here. <clears throat> Do -do, this is all a bunch of forms. Uh, so this, again, this is the existing uh, setup here. This is the alley on the left side of the screen, Del Monte on the right. Um, so this is the existing unit that is being demolished. And a lot of hardscaping and stuff back here. Uh, there's a, a pepper tree that's got to go. Um, and it also shows the neighboring structures. And then the new work <clears throat> from above will look like so. Uh, these weird triangle things, these are actually parking spots. So there's two, there's a, a two bay garage, and then there's a single bay garage. And I guess the fourth one actually is is the existing front house inside the garage. Um, I do plan on using uh, some of the garage space uh, for the front house where I live, um, and then the renter can use the other spot. Um, so this increases the yard space and the spacing between the units. There's 50 foot between the units, uh, nine and a half feet um, from the 
ADU to the property line. So it's actually about 12, 13 feet to the neighbor there. That's the closest neighbor. Um, so it is it is going to impede on their their views a little bit from their from their bedroom. I did peek the roof um, to minimize that. I do need a pitch though. I, I got to put some equipment up in there. Um, this is the utilities. You guys probably don't care about that. Let me find the elevations here. Here's here's a here's one showing the roofs here. Um, so the the garage underneath is actually larger, which provides room for a deck to access mm -hmm. from the uh, sliding door from the unit. Um, and then the unit rooftop is is over on, on the uphill side of it. And that's accessed via some stairs. And they'll, so they'll have their own private, sort of a downstairs area here. It's not real large, um, but it will also include access from the street as well. So they'll have their own entrance and gate and fence to get back to that unit. Um, <clears throat> Here are elevations. This is looking from the alley. So this shows the, the two bay and then the single bay. The single bay is actually uh, higher. So there's some steps to get up on top of that. Um, and the other views here, this is the existing front house. So you can see kind of the height comparison here. This is actually the 30 foot limit line up, up above here. Uh, that 30 foot limit line actually is a sort of a profile. It follows the profile of the existing grade. Uh, so that's, so it varies depending on where you are on the lot, how high you can go. That's why you see some of these staggered houses. Uh, this is looking from inside my yard at the unit. Again, here's the balcony. Uh, there's some dashed lines here showing sort of the limits that you can build out to. Uh, this does have a little overhang over the uh, alley side provides sort of a quick, quick way to park off the alley there if you want to just parallel park without actually blocking into the alley. Uh, these are interior cutaways. Let me go to the floor plan here. That's the existing floor plan. Yeah. Do you have any uh, concepts for what the exterior is going to look like? Like any de exterior design concepts yet? Um, I haven't drawn it into the plans, but I, I think we want to do a do shingles um, or siding on the walls or some combination thereof. Um, if there is any stucco, it's going to be at most just the first level um, mm -hmm. with sort of a, the, the house on top. We really want to keep it very traditional looking, including with the sort of how the overhangs and the eaves are, are done. Um, and the railings as well. None of this glass and ugly stuff like that. I want to, you know, it's going to be a either a Cottage a wood type. railing or something okay. similar to that kind of bar type railing. Um, it's not really going to look like a new a new construction. Um, this is the the floor plans here. Um, so I'm trying to make the most of that space. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see here. I, th I think that's all I've got. Another reason for pitching the roof towards the alley, it provides a good surface here for solar. This is facing uh, south and, and a little bit southwest, so it's it's really ideal for the solar. Um, that's uh, that's all I've got. If I missed anything, um, just ask. On, on your uh, Kevin, on your your first page of your plan, it says, "I got because it sounded like you were going to keep the garage and build on top of it. You're demoing the whole back unit, correct? Yes, that's correct. Right now, it's okay. just uh, it's a one story. There's no garage in the back right now. All right. Do we have any other? questions uh, for Kevin before we kick him out and then discuss. I, I have, have a, question. a question. Okay, go, go for it. Go for it, Virginia. Uh, Kevin, do you plan to drop and collect any rainwater from that new roof? Um, 
honestly, I don't want to because it rains here like three days a year and it rains so much you can't even capture it. I It is going to have plenty of pervious landscaping to absorb. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if they require me to put a catchment barrel, I'll, I'll do it. I'm not certain if it's required or not. Um, I have that actually drawn in here as a downspout from at least one side of the deck to catch that. I, I don't have it in the back on the alley side just because it's it's uh, it's too difficult to it's in the way to, to even put it over there. So this would catch some of that. It could be used for irrigation or mosquito nesting or whatever else. In my experience, when he gets when Kevin gets the ministerial process, he's going to be forced to put a gray water system for his laundry anyway. So just warning you, Kevin. Hey, Kevin, I have a question. Um, I, on the plans, it looks like you only are including like one tiny window in the back and one tiny window on one of the sides. Are you, can you show that to, to me again? Because I was like, if, if I had to live in a place with just like one tiny little window, I'd be upset. <laughs> yeah, so like that one window in the top left corner let me show you the floor plan here, actually. Okay. Sometimes it's hard to tell just from the drawings, like how much light and air and space, you know, a place is going to have. So, so um, right now I have, and I could probably add a window on the kitchen, this end of the kitchen here. Uh, there's there's windows on the corner of the living space, and then also on the bedroom as well. And then there's this. Uh, this is going to be a double, like a six foot wide sliding glass door here uh, from the living room. Keep in mind, there's a huge towering unit right here. So really the, the, the breathing area is kind of off to the sides of that. Um, yeah, so is there yeah. a window above your kitchen sink? Yes, there's also a window here and that kind of opens up to their entry in their lower courtyard area. And then Both in the bathroom, bathroom, there's a window. Okay. Yeah. It's it's probably uh, I mean, small units because you really need wall space too for the furnishings and it's it's it is challenging. I mean, really, the only I could potentially add some more here, um, but then it's just really a window into our space, so it's not really ideal. But it is more light for the tenant, though. So you know, if you have more natural light, you need less electric light. So I just you know, I know you're going to do solar too, but. Some people like natural light more. And then did you have the landscaping planned? I, I must have walked away and came back and missed that. No, they haven't required that yet. It's I understand it's not required for single family developments. Um, so I haven't hired a landscape architect yet. Um, okay. You know, I, I could certainly do some skylights here. This is vaulted on the, on the living room ceiling. Um, so that would be a great way to get some natural light in there. Yeah. I mean, we live in such a lot, you know, a beautiful area that has so much sun. It seems a shame not to take advantage if you can. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you, Tracy. Kevin, have you considered getting a free tree from the city for your street frontage or you want to decide? What tree? Um, Virginia, I think, sent me some info on that. Um, I do like free. I like free beer and free food. Yep, just a thought. Okay. Um, you have to do a 24 inch box, though, don't you, Kevin? And then the city doesn't give those out. That's a good question. I don't know if the city free trees would qualify for the. Actually, the 24 inch, the 24 inch box is, uh, we're going to revise that because they don't transplant as well as the smaller trees and they don't thrive immediately. Usually they've been sitting at the uh, nursery for a long time and it's better to have something like a um, five gallon or 15 at the most. Um, they just get off to a better start and are more healthy than 24 inch. Does the city still require a 24 inch Virginia? Or are you saying they're going to change that requirement? That that code is going to be changed. 
I don't know at the present time. I think you could probably put in a smaller, a tree because it's they they're documented to get off to a better start. So they require a twenty five foot canopy, I think, or something like that. It's really big. Yeah. Oh, that yeah, I don't know about that either. Um, because they're revising all those requirements and the forestry board is helping them out with that. Okay, any more questions for Kevin? Awesome. Um, Anthony, can you remove Kevin from the meeting? It would be my pleasure. <laughs> don't sound too excited. About that. <laughs> I don't know how I can. Let's see here. Um, lock of partition. Uh, I think you just have to Kevin, kick I him think out. You're have to kick yeah, him I out think like Kevin's going to have to. And then I can text him when we're ready to have him come back. <laughs> yeah, that would probably be the best way. Okay, great. Uh, so this did go in front of obviously the project review committee and it did pass unanimously. I just think that as board members, we should be held up to a higher scrutiny than the regular people that come through here with projects. So that's why this wasn't on the consent agenda. Otherwise, it typically would be because uh, it is, you know, a companion unit, plenty of parking. I'm not too, I mean, Personally, I wouldn't remove a pepper tree, but I love free food in my backyard, but I understand it's got to go. Um, but there's not really much objectionable about it. So does anyone have any other concerns, questions, discussion? I have a question for Kevin. Oh, is that going to become a short term vacation rental? <laughs> uh, boo, we should have put him back in. We got to put him back in. <laughs> it's not. I you made that. I made that joke at the uh, PRC committee, but uh, yeah, it's definitely not. Um, it, it 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 was. I mean, Kevin's given a lot of good thought to this. I feel like we saw a few more renders of what it might look like um, than we just saw tonight, but it doesn't matter. I mean, those renders were also, unless I'm making it up, it just he he gave good consideration to the community plan and uh, and all that stuff. So I, I have zero problems with what he's proposing. Will you make a motion? It's a very clean project. It, it, it's below the FAR. It's yeah. got parking. It's below the 30 foot height limit. I can support this project. Yeah, you can it tell it's generous, generous setbacks. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I motion to approve the project as is. Thanks, Chris. And Jane, I got you as a second, enthusiastic second. Put that in the minutes. Um, all right, and then Tracy, call the roll. I think you're still muted. Sorry, I was typing. I don't like to type and be on, like, have the volume on because you guys can hear me like pounding on the keyboard and it's just, it's tacky. So, anyways, okay. Uh, Anthony. Yes. Yes. Andrea. Yes. Approved. Yeah. Andrew. <laughs> yes. Craig. Hi. Chris. George. Yes. Jane. Yes. Jenna. Yes. Nicole. Where, where's he? Where, where, where'd you go? <laughs> Is Nicole offline? Yeah, I don't see her. Okay. Uh, Newman. Yes. Uh, Richard. Yes. Thank you, Tom. Yes. Uh, I vote yes. Virginia. Yes. All righty. Motion passes. Okay. I'll go ahead and text Kevin. You are welcome back. Okay, great. Uh, so, yes, we're wrapping up to the end of the meeting. So, uh, I, technically, we still are online voting is still open until 8. 
so we can't really announce the election results. Uh, but seeing as how we had less people run than for seats available, I think we all kind of know how the election results are going to go. Um, but awesome job to our election community, you know, Tracy and Kevin and, and Virginia and Jane and everyone who helped out to, I think we probably had the smoothest, most options for voting. So again, uh, I'm just really glad you all stepped up and helped out. And Corey. And Corey, yeah. yeah. For the town council, this was a all hands on deck OB emergency. Uh, okay, cool. So from my end, the yeah, the only thing I have announcements for next month, uh, we do have to reappoint all of the committees and reelect the executive board. Um, so please think about you know what committees you want to join or you know, if you want to be on the e board. We so standing committees we have currently are parks project review, uh, community outreach, and transportation. You can also always you know, propose a committee if you think we're missing something. Um, I know some other boards have more committees, but uh, if you do have the time to volunteer, we're meeting every other month. So it's really not that much more to talk, take on. Uh, and we'd love to have you on all these different things. This is, and then sad announcement. This is Jenna's last meeting. Um, she's not running again this year. She's busy, but she'll still be engaged with us because she's uh, helping with the franchise agreement. So we'll hopefully see her around. Usually we'd give you a little plaque to <laughs> for your service, but yeah, a round of applause. <laughs> It's been great having you, and I hope you come back when things settle down a little bit more wherever you can. Thank you. Yes, and uh, hopefully, fingers crossed that this franchise agreement stuff goes well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that and like I said, library. Uh, we're going to be talking library next month. So anyone who's at all interested in the library, tell them to come. Remember, the money we got. Oh yeah, Craig's got to tell us how much money we've got. Treasures report one thousand two hundred eighty-five thousand cents, and I standing the business center for a job. Thanks. Um. And I might be in contact with you. I got to the PO box today and realized that I don't know where the PO box key was. I was staring at my keychain for such a long time until the owner of the business center came over and he's like, "Do you have your key?" And I was like, "I really don't think I do." <laughs> Just yeah. Um. So. I'll have to talk about replacements, um, but I'm sure it's somewhere. I, I just took all my keys off the other day, and then I think it just fell off when I did that. So, so Craig, Craig, can you give me a thumbs up? I'm just gonna read that number back to you. One, two, three, five, five, five. That is correct. Thank you, Andrea. Have something. Uh, Andrea, um, I wanted to and ask the board if they would like to receive copies of the OB Library Friends newsletters. Um, if you can, um, I, I put in the um, chat, oblibraryfriends at gmail.com, just drop me a note and say, I wanna be in the, the newsletter mailing list and send me your email. And that'd be great. We have great newsletters. Frank publishes them all the time in <laughs> OB Rad. <laughs> Anyway, thank you. That's it. Yeah, and thank you. And we look forward to our conversation next month. Uh, did Kevin make it back? Oh, there he is. Hey. <laughs> I was going to say, did anybody like Kevin know that his project failed? <laughs> we hate it. <laughs> we don't approve anything without a roof deck in this neighborhood. Glass and stucco. I'll, I'll uh, fill out the, I think, Bulletin 620 form for you tomorrow. And send that in. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay, quick question on the election. So, when will the results um, become public? Tracy, do you want? Um, uh, Kevin has the physical ballots. Have you counted those all? Yeah, no? we we actually have the totals now, and there's like 15 minutes left to before the end of voting. I mean, I could, I will have the totals at like 8:01. Okay. <laughs> so it just, just so happens that our meeting is gonna, 
You're not going to risk a protection. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, no, Yes, you did. Vote. You voted for yourself, Craig. I am so right. No, you're not. Imagine you are not. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if we want to. Hey, Kevin, do you want to talk about the? No, that's okay. Do you want to talk about the District Five thing? No, I'm waiting for all those online votes to start rolling in. Okay. Well, I don't think I don't think that's going to happen. But, is there? Uh, is there well, yeah. If any <laughs> board members didn't vote, I'm going to be disappointed in you. I put my vote in today. Um, but I did want to I did want to make a I did want to make an announcement though. Um, we did have a write-in candidate at the last minute. Um, she submitted an application a couple days ago. Um, her name is Melanie Boda, and she's writing. Uh, she was a write-in candidate for um, District One, so she is a neighbor of mine. Um, I know Melanie for years, and she's a, a quality human being who really cares about the community and the people who live here. So, um, like I said, she was the only write-in candidate that we had this year, and um, she's she is online right now, but you can't see her. <laughs> she might be able to talk if if you if we want to ask her questions or whatever. But um, well, I think you know she's. <laughs> Well, yeah, so, we'll talk to her in April when we. Yeah, we can talk to her in April. Uh, you know, she she's a uh, she just had a surgery the other day, so she's still um, she's still kind of recovering from that. So we'll we'll talk to her in April. I <laughs> think. Um, but she says her her text says she's still here. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but I don't so have Tracy, I don't, we're excited just to say. have you. And then after those results, um, we'll get in touch with Andrew about what to do with any vacant seats we might have. Yeah. yeah. So, so after, after the results, I'm going to actually make a, a social media post and asking people if they want to uh, shoot for an appointment, um, mm -hmm. because we're going to have a couple of still vacant slots that we need to, to put a body in. So I'm going to make an announcement and then, um, talk to people about the process of getting appointed and stuff. So hopefully we'll have some people in April who are interested. Yeah. yeah. Well, and we're also not the only board in this position. A lot of boards are facing the same thing. It's just been hard to, you know, get people involved this year, which is silly because it's, you know, easier than ever. You don't have to fight for parking on a Wednesday night at the yes. rec center. So yes. um, um, and part of the reason I asked the question is just because in the event that this is somebody's last meeting, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody who's in attendance today, and I don't know if that's the case or not, but um, yeah. but really, that's why I was asking. No, okay, you're, you're uh, you feel safe enough to make that projection that uh, I I feel safe enough to make the projection that most of the incumbents have qualified for their seats. Okay. <laughs> so right. yeah, I I think we're okay there. Um, Good. Good. There was there was a small um, snafu that. Uh, we are going to, I guess, Kevin and I have been kind of talking about and trying to figure out what to do. So um, maybe Kevin wants to talk about it. Yeah, it's I, basically it's, a book. Yeah, it's really a no harm, no foul thing. It's, I don't think it's going to change the outcome, but uh, I guess we can deal with that with the results um, next month. Yeah, it's it's not a big deal. <laughs> nobody Nobody is going anywhere, put it that way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank um, you. And then, uh, I as far as secretary, I don't have anything, but I do have something for the commission. Oh, but if sure. someone if someone wants to go before me, please do. No, I think you're you're up. Okay. All righty. So the Arts and Culture Commission just recently. Um, announced this really amazing opportunity for uh, public art grant or a public art uh, project. And it's actually, it's not in our district, but it's really a great project um, and a huge budget. It's $170,000, approximately $170,000 for the Buyer Park Public Art Project. So uh, they're asking for artists or teams of artists to uh, submit applications for public art for this new park that they're installing. Um, 
And like I said, it is an approximate $170,000 art budget, which is pretty remarkable. Yeah. And um, the application deadline for that is March 25th. So um, all you need to do, I think you just have to be a, uh, there was something about, I don't even think you have to be a San Diego resident for this. So, uh, but there's more, there's more information in the, the request um, or the RFQ. So I will post this in the chat, the link to it. And if you know anybody who does uh, large public art projects or public art installation work, or even somebody who's kind of looking to do that, um, who's writing on our. Yeah, Anthony, I don't know. Can you um, shut that down? Thank you. <laughs> Somebody is being crazy. So anyways, the link is in the chat right now and um, please, you know, put it out there and promote it because it's a really, really amazing opportunity to get yeah. you know, art in a brand new park. So that's it from the commission. Thanks. That's, I'm, that's actually huge. I'll um, for sure pass that along to the artist I know. Um, great. Anyone else? Uh, Anthony, how is NACAP going? The near well, the airport, airport noise, airport. Anac, yeah. Uh, actually, we yeah. had a very we had a very lively meeting last month. Uh, the next month's meetings off. April twenty first. Um, the, the meeting was around some provisional um, discussions on how to reduce noise in outside of the Part one hundred and fifty study they've been doing for many years. So, um, I don't think it went anywhere. It's highly technical. So we threw it back to the uh, technical advisory committee. So. Um, very lively though so that's all i could say so if you want to join in in some uh let me know if you want to participate or or have any public comment for those uh meetings there um every other month and I, like i said i think it's april 21st 4 p.m um the next one yeah I'm, I'm curious about what people were saying and i mean you know this is the kind of thing that if i had a moment i would have liked to be a fly on the wall but i mean what were what what was happening at this meeting uh, that you were saying uh, lightly. Uh, well, um, because there's concurrently there's a, another a set of actions being done through the through the airport and through the FAA. Uh, these these provisional actions to reduce noise would have been sort of um, double extra effort for nothing gained, and it wasn't ran through the technical advisory committee that was set up by the ANAC. So. It's more of an internal thing, but ultimately the end result would be to push aircraft out another, uh, like at least a mile or more off the shore before they turn inward and over Point Loma. Uh, but most of the complaints came out of Mission Beach because, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's all I wanted. That's I don't want to. I've heard La Jolla and Mission Beach are trying to push the planes over to back, us. Back I was to us, contacted yeah. by a lot of yeah. conservative people who are like, do you know? So yeah. if you do meetings. public comments, do go to the April meeting. Yeah, I need some. I need some help. Like that. Yeah, I can't be the only one being beat up on it at Ocean Beach because uh, everybody other than myself and the Peninsula folks are uh, getting it from the La Jolla people. So and Mission Beach. Well, Anthony, just to let you know that when I attend the Mission Beach Town Council meetings, I always stand up for Ocean Beach because, yeah. you know, I'm like, we're, we have enough noise. Why are you trying to, like, put it back on it? You know, so, yeah, I, yeah. I try to stand up for OB because, Thank you. yeah, they're not getting nearly as much as we are and they're complaining more. So, oh, yeah. Anything else? Jenna, what's your dog's name? Kevin and then Kevin can go. <laughs> oh, Lexi, she she needed some attention. Hi. <laughs> hey, hello. Right, Kevin, now your report. Um, oh. So the uh, there is not going to be a project review committee meeting this month. Uh, next will be April. Um, I want to say I did attend a, a lot of meetings in the past month. And this was mostly relating to that. A vacation rental deal, um, but it was, it was a I you know some of you I know already attend some of the other community meetings, um, but I would urge, urge you guys to you know branch out and see what they're talking about. Uh, one that was of particular interest was I think it was North Park uh, wants to bring something maybe to CPC to 
try and change how the uh, city meetings are run to give opposition groups more time uh, on on issues. Because as you know, in the past, it was you know the the presenter gets all the airtime, and then the rest are sort of left sort of fighting from the corners, and they could at least pull together public comment time. Um, and then of course now with the COVID and the Zoom meetings, the public comment you know, on, on big issues gets one minute at a time. So it's really tough to, to be heard on that. So that, that was one thing of particular interest, but I would urge you guys to participate in those meetings, especially the beach communities and, uh, you know, corroborate uh, more with our local communities because we need, we need all the help we can get. Yeah. Awesome. Kevin, I heard from a colleague of mine on the Linda Vista planning board, um, gave me an update on your, your, uh, presentation over there so um, anyways i think it's a good idea to get some reach as well andrea i have a an update from the airport just from the uh program things um so first thing is i mentioned this at our last meeting but we've got a, a opportunity that closes end of day tomorrow for a public art mentorship program um very unique the first of its kind that we know of at an airport in this country um, an opportunity for a, a emerging artists, a young artist to um, mentor, um, be a mentee under a, a mentor um, for a new public art project tied to the terminal redevelopment program at the airport. So tell your friends if you know, it's it's really suited for folks who want to get into public art, but there's a barrier to that. This helps try to break that barrier. So um, closes tomorrow, $20,000 for your project. Um, and then the second thing is um, the region, I, some of you I know know this, um, the region lost a strong, strong um, advocate for arts and culture in Larry Baza, who was the chair of the California Arts Council. Uh, he is on our art, was on our airport arts advisory committee, good friend of mine. Um, and um, so the airport is looking at ways to pay tribute to him. If you don't know who this guy is, um, Google him because he did tremendous work for his 40 year, 50 year career. Um, and unfortunately he passed due to COVID. So um, um, Larry Baza, so that's it. Hey, Chris, the, the commission meeting, we, we paid tribute to him and I'm incredibly saddened that I didn't get a chance to meet him. I, I imagine that he was a really wonderful, helpful uh, advocate for the arts and culture community. And uh, like I said, I didn't even know this man. And I was like crying in the meeting because some of the things that people were saying about him were just wonderful. So I'm I'm happy that you had an opportunity to meet him because it sounds like he was a great person. And he just did it the right way, not to prolong this, but um, the things you'll read about him is how calm and kind he was. And yet here, here he was one of the most powerful advocates really known nationally. And um, how he came to be on the airport arts advisory committee is um, after many polite um, emails back and forth, trying to convince him to join, finally ran, him, ran into him at the grocery store. And the guy was so humble and had some real strong questions, but ultimately agreed to do this and was really happy that he did. But um, yeah, just a model for, for us in the arts and culture field to try to represent. So uh, more to come there, uh, but just wanted to share some awareness. He was just a great person. So awesome. thank you for my air time. I have one more Peace. report, if I may, Andrea, on uh, so far, Kevin. Park and Rec. Um, so I have been following their meetings and whenever it involves any you know beach related stuff. Um, as far as capital improvement projects, the um, there's three particular ones in there, uh, Santa Cruz Avenue stairs, uh, Narragansett Avenue stairs, and the uh, Bermuda beach stairs. So Bermuda, we saw at the board, that's at 100% design stage. There's still funding left that's been allocated. So hopefully they don't take that away. Um, the Narragansett is at 30% design stage, uh, and that's to replace the you know, disintegrating stairwell that's there now. It is sort of mostly functional now, uh, you know, other than getting tetanus. Uh, and then the uh, Santa Cruz stairs, that's the wooden stairs down to Santa Cruz Cove, as well as walkways extending in either direction from that that are being undermined and are going to collapse at some point during these big waves. Uh, that's also at 30% design stage and has still some, a little bit of funding uh, left. So, I just want to give that update. Hopefully we can see those uh, come to our board fairly soon. 
And also, I wanted to mention there's three minutes left until votes or voting is cut off. Um, if somebody has to run, if we have a quorum still, we can announce the election results at, at eight. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything that um, we can talk about. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know how the tree program is going with Virginia. Um, you know, is the I city still about... is the city still doing trees? Is the historical society doing anything? I mean, come on, people. Jane. Jane has something. Yeah. Well, the Ocean Beach Historical Society has several presentations on their website. So if you go to their website, you just have to click on one of them, and we have a, a great trolley. Oh, the trolley ride is terrific. Yeah. <laughs> is it virtual trolley ride? It, it's virtual. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Was anything as, as for trees, they're they're pushing the tree street tree program again, and uh, there's always uh -huh. a waiting list. But my next door neighbors did get their tree. I think they waited three years. But um, other than that, they just need they need more staffing. Anything to do with trees is uh, they're critically understaffed, so they can barely keep up with the nuisance reports of where branches broke and a tree needs to come down or that sort of thing. So, if you'd like a free tree, you can sign up now. Just be patient. I have seen the the palm weevils getting some media attention as of recently, mm -hmm. and it was their nuisance. They are, yeah. yeah. Do we know? Of, no, Virginia. The Canary no. Island palms have been getting killed all over Ocean Beach. The city's cutting them down everywhere. That's their favorite food, but they will attack any any type of palm. So, and it, so Virginia, I was I had a question about that. I saw something uh -huh. that Campbell's office put out about the the palm weevil, and it said that the the date palm was actually its favorite food, but it can move on to other ones. Are we, is anybody talking about the risk of like losing all of our palm trees now? Or, I mean, what are we going to do to mitigate that? Do you know? Well, it's, it's uh, the type of thing where once a tree shows any symptoms, it's gone or already. Because a palm only has one growth point. And if that's damaged, they never have side shoots like other plants that you can think of. So, that's where the eggs are laid. That's where the weevils hatch. And they eat that heart of palm. And once the leaves start falling limp, like you see them and turning brown, the tree can't be revived. So the best way to do it is to actually go and preventively spray all of the palms with insecticide. And you can imagine the, um, expense and the environmental consequences of that. So uh, occasionally I've heard that occasionally they're able to save a tree that has an infestation, but it's very rare. So it, it could be much worse. They're, they're very vigorous, strong beetles. They can fly long distances and they could go wherever they want. So it's we don't really know how to deal with it other countries apparently there are other countries that are getting getting some ground when they're dealing with them but it takes a massive effort and a lot of money behind it so what you're saying is that the date palms might not be the first palms to start going away and we should expect further palms to be decimated well yeah from what i've seen so far most of the ones I've seen so far have been the date palms and they're, they're nice looking trees. Uh, but if they run short of their favorites, they will colonize any type of palm. Wow. 801. 801. Well, Kevin, I sent you the results. Can you, did you get them? Yes, I did. Let me change my screen again here. Um, <clears throat> so we can put the numbers and everything in the minutes. Uh, of this meeting, but um, the election results, uh, Melanie Boda is our new 
rep for District 1. Um, Richard Merriman, District 2. Chris Chalupski, District uh, District 3. Uh, Craig won District 4. Um, District 5, uh, we, we kind of touched on this. Um, George ran for District 5, but he is not qualified to run for a District 5 seat. I understand that he, you know, he, he is, he was appointed to district five. Um, so I think the election committee is under the impression that George is not eligible to be voted in for district five and would have to seek a uh, reappointment to that seat or really any of the available uh, seats. Uh, district six, uh, Tom Goronsky won district six. Uh, district seven is vacant as well as the at-large seat is also vacant. And also uh, District 5, I, I guess, technically is vacant as well. Uh, so there's three vacancies that uh, we can appoint at the next meeting, I suppose. Hopefully George is one of them. Did you uh, alert George to this prior? When he- we, Yeah, we actually didn't, re we didn't recognize it until, um today actually and honestly i i just i i trust people like a lot to to know the rules sometimes and it, it was an oversight on my part that i didn't look at it and i honestly thought that once you were appointed to a seat you could continue to run for that seat and it was you know some kevin just made it obvious to me that that is not something that you can do you can't you can't rerun for an appointed seat if you don't live in that district. And that was just completely an oversight on my part, but um, I knew that there wasn't gonna be an issue with appointing him in April, so. <laughs> um, so yeah. If he's a qualified candidate and there was no one running for the at-large seat, wouldn't it, can we, uh, appoint the sim most simple way to do it, sorry. Yeah, yes, yeah, it was, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it, you know, Kevin pointed that out to me and I really, honestly, I did not know that you could not run for a seat that you were, for a seat that you were appointed into before. So that was my oversight and I apologize for that, George, but you're not going anywhere, dude. I can't really blame George. I, I think um, it probably became a little bit more clear to him when he was trying to vote for himself and realized he wasn't in the district that he was voting in. So that's kind of what triggered that. But uh, better to learn it now than uh, when it has some consequence to it. So, yeah. And the last the last couple of years of our elections, we've actually had quite a few appointments here and there. So that's I think why I just went. Ah, oh, well, that's just the way it is. The people are in that district, and that's where they run. So you know. <laughs> so boo, my fault. But. Anyways, so um, like I said earlier, I'm gonna post on social media that we have seats available. And um, I know that there are a couple of members currently that still want to try to be appointed. So um, get your applications into me, please. George, you don't need to, I already have yours. Well, thank you. I'm glad my guy won, Tom. Um... But thanks everyone for this March meeting. Um, stay safe out there. Get your vaccines when you can. Bye guys. Thanks Bye, everyone. Thank it's been you. A pleasure. Thanks Have a good one. Thanks. I'll be. It's like.